Now, hi, good afternoon. I'm Amanda Benedict, Vice President of Sterilization at Amy, and I'm sitting down today with Christina Hopkins of Ofsted and Associates. Christina, um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and your role. Sure, thanks, Amanda. Uh, I'm Christina Hopkins. I'm the Research Manager at Ofsted and Associates, and there is where I actually lead our studies on device processing and quality management in device processing, including the study we're going to talk about today. Okay, well, thank you. Wonderful to have you here today. And I'm looking forward to talking about the new paper that's coming out, Beyond Endoscopes, Pilot Study of Surgical Instrument Lumen Inspection. I wanted to talk a little bit first about what was the goal of this research and, and particularly what gap in knowledge were uh, you and, and your research team trying to address? Yeah, so, you know, both Amy and Aorin have really strong recommendations for visual inspection of endoscopes. And we know that sterile processing techs and endotechs are increasingly using boroscopes to look at the insides of their endoscopes, so those ports and those channel surfaces. And the research is showing that too. So our group is published and there's a lot of other research groups that are doing work on boroscope inspections of endoscopes. Mm -hmm. Now on surgical instruments, we are, you know, as far as we know, there hasn't been a lot of work on, uh, at least a lot of work published on visual inspection of lumened surgical instruments in the last decade or so, and, and really going back to some of the foundational work that was done by Ralph Basile and Johanna Sisi back in 2012. So our goal with this research was really to kind of explore if boroscope inspections can bring the same kind of value to uh, inspection of surgical instrument lumens as they have with endoscope channels. Okay, boroscopes are another um, really hot topic. I know there's increasing use of them and um, you know, one of the things I saw in this study is that uh, those who participated were trained in the use of boroscopes, mm -hmm. which is, you know, really important uh, to good outcomes. So I, I wanted to ask a bit about how the work was conducted, and can you tell us a little bit about the study methods? Yeah, absolutely. We actually were able to collaborate with a super great sterile processing manager who is um, Steve Adams. He's a past mm -hmm. president of Isham and HSPA, I know a familiar name, I'm sure. And uh, he is sterile processing manager at LifeBridge Health in Baltimore. And so we worked with his team uh, and it, it, you know, it was, it's a pilot study. It was a pretty straightforward study. Um, we picked two kinds of surgical instruments that have lumens. So the first one was a Fraser section tips. And the second one was the arthroscopic shaver hand pieces, which in this field, you know, is where some of the really foundational work on visual inspection of surgical instruments was done by uh, Johanna Sisi and Ralph Basile back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted to do is kind of revisit that um, approach. And so we, we picked these two instruments and we used the boroscope to do inspections of them after they'd been, so these were patient ready, after they'd been sterilized. Mm -hmm. And our goal with this was really just to find, you know, what did they look like on the inside? Are there interesting internal features or architecture? Um, are they damaged? Are they dirty? You know, and if we found any that were dirty, our thought had, you know, our, our plan was to just see if recleaning works. So reclean them, reinspect them, and find out, does it get the dirt out? So you used a, a couple different uh, types of instruments, different designs. Can you highlight a little bit about why that's particularly important for the study? Yeah, so we wanted to look at a couple different things because, you know, there's a lot of variety in, in surgical instruments, and we're only really scratching the surface with this um, as a pilot study. But what we wanted to do is, you know, we're really interested in this idea of architecture on the insides, because you think of uh, Fraser's section, it's, it's kind of just sort of a tube with a bend in it, right? It doesn't seem like there should be much to it. But when you look in both sections and shavers, there's a lot going on. There are you know, kind of abrupt changes in the diameters of the lumen. Uh, there's ridges that run perpendicular to the lumen's length. You've got elbows, you've got valves, you've got all kinds of stuff that's going on inside. And so what we were really interested in, or what we were really surprised by, I guess, rather, is, um, you know, number one, that complexity in, in both types of instruments. And then number two, what we started finding as we looked at more and more of these is that all of those features we noted didn't necessarily look the same in every single instrument that we looked at. So in one section, maybe you've got a ridge that is you know, crisp and smooth. And in the next section, it's maybe got a little curl on it. And in the next section, you've got big jagged claws. And 
you know, the ultimate takeaway is that you wouldn't know that with out looking inside, all these instruments looked the same on the outside. And so we wanted to look at a, a number of instruments of the same type, as well as a couple instruments, um, different instruments types to see if we were seeing that same thing, um, seeing the same things, or if we were seeing that same complexity in, in everything we looked at. Okay. And tell us a little bit about what you concluded from the research. Yeah, so I think number one sort of a, a meta finding that we had is uh, you've really got to expect the unexpected. This is true with endoscopes. It's true with surgical instruments as well. Uh, you know, we did this in a, a really formal kind of institution approved study where we went through and we got all the permissions. And uh, Steve actually met with all of his stakeholders before we did any data collection um, to kind of run through what we were doing, what we might find, and if we found that, what what could they do about it? What would be their response? And we were really glad that we did that groundwork because we found stuff. And so I think one big takeaway I want um, anybody who reads this paper to start with is if you're going to look in your instruments, make sure you've got a whole team with you to help you think through what you're going to do if you find something. Because chances are it's not an if, it's a win. <laughs> right, right. So have a plan. Have a plan, absolutely. And then when it came to the actual inspections, you know, like I mentioned before, we found that the, the interior of these are really complex. There's a lot going on, you know, and most of the instruments had some kind of defect, whether it was a brush bristle or some fibers or little, you know, speckles of debris. And we saw stuff that, that looked, you know, decidedly more biological. And we've got a lot of great pictures for this in the paper too. So make sure you check those out. Um, but so we saw a lot of instruments that had, you know, debris or, or some kind of soil. Um, and what we found is that in the instruments we recleaned, frequently it didn't work. And that was even with some enhanced, you know, cleaning methods and stuff, really trying to get that debris out. Um, and the site actually ended up replacing a few of their instruments. Um, and that actually was kind of a cool thing. It, it gave us an opportunity to look inside a few brand new instruments as well that had only been used a couple of times. And, you know, sort of the last big takeaway we had was that even in those new instruments that had been used three, four, five times, uh, we were still seeing new damage. There was residues, stuff was starting to build up and discolor. So, you know, you've really got to be right on top of this from the very beginning. And I think that's, uh, that's a really important finding. So, um, what are the next steps? And I, I did notice that your paper has some limitations. Would that suggest opportunities for future uh, research in additional directions that this could go? Oh, undoubtedly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So no this, shortage of ideas, right? No, you know, as a pilot study, we hope that this is, you know, we, we thought we found some, some cool stuff um, for sure, you know, some interesting and compelling findings, but it, it's firmly a pilot study. And we hope that people who read this go, you know, I wonder, uh, and then run with that. <laughs> and, um, you know, so this was a study that was a pilot study. It was a small number of instruments at one site. And, you know, we're actually planning on um, initiating what we're calling the Lumens 2.0 study uh, this summer. And so we'll be hoping to expand on some of the findings of this paper and have some results on that later this year. But we also hope that others take a look at this and, you know, go and explore on their own and, and not only explore, but bring those findings to the field. So whether it's through peer reviewed literature, bring it to professional conferences, or, you know, frankly, too, make sure that it gets to those standards and guidelines meetings so that the decision makers at those have access to all of that information as well. Well, Lumens 2.0, I love that. And I look forward <laughs> to reading that and uh, great call to action. Uh, and speaking of standards, um, that is uh, one of the things that standards does is help to address challenges and, and fill gaps. And I did notice in your conclusion, you mentioned that there's little guidance that exists coming from um, manufacturers or coming from regulatory agencies. So what are your thoughts as far as how standards and uh, technical documents that provide guidance um, from the voluntary consensus world can help? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think standards have a huge role in this. Uh, one thing that we ran into as we did this study and, and kind of looked into some of the work that's been done and <clears throat> information that's available right now is that manufacturer IFU for surgical instruments, at least some of the ones that we looked at, don't always necessarily even say to inspect the interior surfaces mm -hmm. of the instruments. 
And even if they do suggest looking at the interiors, there's not a whole lot of guidance from the manufacturers or, or really from anywhere else on, you know, what frontline personnel should be looking for, what normal looks like, what normal doesn't look like. And, you know, so even if people are, are starting to look at these, they don't have a whole lot of uh, guidance for, for what they should be looking for and how they should be responding to that. And so I think that is a place where standard, standards and guideline issuing bodies can bring manufacturers, they can bring end users, regulatory agencies, um, and professional organizations all to the same table to develop some guidance that, that kind of exceeds what we're seeing in the IFU, both with regard to when to use boroscopes, or are there certain instruments that should be focused on, or how frequently they should be expect, uh, inspected, excuse me, and then how to respond to findings. So if you see something like lint or brush bristle or tissue or you know that kind of thing is it reclean is it sent for repair is it replace i think that's where you know if we can get that group of people together we can start coming up with some really useful guidance for the front line okay so going beyond process to really some practical uh applications some examples and so on to help people really understand what to look for how to do it and then what to do with it once you found it Absolutely. Okay. So if um, there's one last thing that you wanted to leave folks with, um, a particular um, uh, call to action or uh, just something that you really want them to take away, what would it be? Yeah, you know, I really hope that that Amy stakeholders, um, you know, like I said, that group above the professional organizations, the regulatory bodies, the manufacturer, uh, manufacturers, all, all of those, I, I really hope that we can bring those to the table, both to, um, you know, establish that kind of standard for practice for boroscope use in surgical instruments, because that that takes the burden off of frontline personnel to have to reinvent the wheel with every new quality initiative they want to implement. And, you know, I think the other big thing is that this is a start. This paper is a, is sort of the, the first foray back into this field. And I, you know, we really love to see others start to look at theirs, publish, and, and bring that evidence to the discussion. So we, we hope to see more. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Christina. This has been a great talk. Um, really important work coming out of uh, Offset and Associates, and we look forward to how this is going to be implemented, the, the results of this study. So thank you. Thank you.